Good afternoon. Welcome to the New America Foundation. I'm Peter Bergen, the Director of National Security Studies. Uh, we had 160 people show up and uh, quite a lot of people managed to brave the rain, so we thank you for that. Um, it's my privilege to introduce uh, Steve Cole, who is the President of uh, the New America Foundation. Um, the author of, uh, he just, uh, just finished his seventh book yesterday. Uh, the winner of uh, two Pulitzer Prizes uh, in explanatory journalism and also nonfiction, and a finalist in biography. Uh, the author of Ghost Wars, which many of you will have read, and also the Bin Ladens. Um, and uh, Steve has been reporting on South Asia since the early 90s. In fact, I remember pieces that Steve had written in 1993, uh, thinking how great they were at the time, and they still hold up, hold up very well today. And uh, Susan Glasser, uh, a frequent collaborator of ours, the editor-in-chief of Foreign Policy magazine, the author of Kremlin Rising. Uh, Susan has reported on every aspect of the war on terror. She, was, uh, she did uh, a piece about the Battle of Tora Bora, which I think really was uh, the definitive <coughs> take of the Times in, in 2002 about what really happened there. Uh, was uh, also the national editor of the Washington Post. Uh, editing many of these stories as they came out uh, over the past decade. And so what we thought we would do today um, is have a conversation between ourselves for half an hour in which uh, Susan would be sort of both moderator and participant um, and uh, talk about uh, kind of where we are 10 years later. I just wanted to throw out a few quick ideas. I, th I think it would have been um, unpredictable that only 17 Americans would have died in jihadi terrorist attacks since 9-11 in the past decade uh, if we'd had this conversation, say, a year after 9-11. I think it would have been unpredictable that not a single jihadi terrorist would have uh, engaged in a chemical, biological, radiological, or nuclear uh, materials attack in the United States since 9-11. I think it would have been unpredictable that it would take 10 years to have found bin Laden. I think it would have been unpredictable that we'd still be in Afghanistan and pr planning to be there <coughs> um, past 2014. I think it would have been unpredictable that we're still in Iraq. I think it would un be unpredictable that an anti-war president would be now engaging in wars in at least five Muslim countries, as by my count, maybe six if you include Somalia. So Iraq, Yemen, uh, Libya, Afghanistan, Pakistan. Um, and so there are many things that are sort of surprising. Um, and I guess one quick question to both of you, is there anything that isn't surprising? <laughs> I, you know, I think it's a great question, and I'm hoping Steve will jump in. But you started speaking. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to start and say thank you to both of you for, for having us. I mean, I, you know, these two folks, I mean, to the extent that we've all for the last 10 years been engaged in a process of learning about South Asia and the consequences and the follow-on effects from September 11th, you know, they've been you know, all of our teachers in, in having been engaged with this subject deeply, you know, before September 11th and, you know, in a personal level, been my teacher as well. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's great to be able to have this conversation. Um, you know, I think Steve Call, who was at the time the managing editor of the Washington Post, um, you know, I knew he really had credibility on this subject when he dispatched me from Moscow to Central Asia and he said, your mission is to get connected with uh, General Dostum and you really, <laughs> you've got to be the first person to land an interview with General Dostum after the attack. And you did. And, and I did. And I walked around Tashkent, Uzbekistan for literally three days and I kept, there were several other reporters there and they were doing whatever they're doing. I said, but you don't understand, I don't really know who this guy is, but I've got to get an interview <laughs> with this General Dostum guy and it took three translators. Uh, and multiple satellite phones uh, before I had my brief conversation, if it was actually him, uh, you know, <laughs> where he described his, his horseback campaign against the Taliban. But, you know, the point is that, that both Peter and, and Steve, you know, really have been immersed in this subject. And, and actually, I'm glad you, you asked the question about what is it maybe that was predictable that came out here, because in a different way, that's, that's what I was going to suggest is the question you both were deeply immersed in the pre-story, the story before September 11th of, um, you know, both the rise of Al-Qaeda, its, its, its merger and intertwining with the Taliban, uh, you know, the, the deep dysfunctions of Pakistan, the legacy of our own engagement uh, there, you know, the subject of, of Steve's book. Peter was the person who had the, the first interview with, with bin Laden. Um, you know, looking back on it now, I can say, you know, there were many things, uh, not only on Peter's list, but you know, many more that, that I was completely you know, astounded and befuddled by over the last decade. 
the disastrous American on the ground engagement, uh, you know, in Afghanistan, while perhaps we uh, didn't fully anticipate it, on some level is also not completely surprising or unpredictable. If you look at the broad sweep of, of history and as we were just talking before here, um, because I was based in, in Russia at the time, I went back and, and spoke with several of the Soviet generals who had led uh, the military campaign in Afghanistan uh, disastrously, of course, in the 1980s, including Boris Gromov, who was the last uh, Soviet commander in Afghanistan. He's the guy who famously walked across the uh, Friendship Bridge in 1989 to end the Soviet involvement there. And what he said on September 17, 2001 was, uh, if any American ground troops set foot uh, on the ground in Afghanistan, it will be a disaster for the United States. And at the time, of course, it sort of, this was just so wildly against our thinking, it sort of disappeared and sank without a stone, you know, that story and that warning. But, you know, certainly if you were paying attention, I think it was out there uh, to be known. But well, I think the Soviets were influential, actually, in some of Rumsfeld's thinking and some of the others in the fall of 2001, that whole idea of the light footprint and, and the idea that, um, it was important not to deploy in Pashtun areas because you would provoke a revolt. And I think they were actually fighting the last war a little bit. And I don't think it always served them well myself, especially in the first couple of years. It's a little bit hard to do the thought experiment because Iraq so distorts what happens. I mean, really, by the time you get to 2002, it's, it's the controlling event in American military strategy, and it has impact in Afghanistan as well. But when you look back on those choices that culminated at Tora Bora with the relatively limited direct options to um, go up that hillside, and you were you know, down in Nangarhar talking to the unreliable militias that <laughs> <laughs> were the instrument of the ground operation at Tora Bora, but you go back to it, and, and there was, I, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting it was irrational, but there was a reading of uh, Soviet experience, which essentially, I think we can, whatever uh, diagnosis of the many mistakes that NATO and the United States have made in Afghanistan since 9-11, they are not the same mistakes that the Soviet Union made, in my opinion. The Soviet Union was proceeding from a com completely different and much more um, uh, illegitimate position uh, from the beginning. And the result was that as soon as they came in and tried to impose a revolution on the country, they had a revolt. And it was the revolt that informed their thinking about the war from the very beginning, whereas the American revolt took much longer <laughs> to unfold. It, it, took, it took many more mistakes and more years to create the the kind of ground for uh, Taliban resurgence and the, and the kind of failure of the Afghan government to take hold. The Soviets had that happen to them right away. And then, of course, British experience was similar. Uh, you would, they would march through these same territories and provoke risings on a fairly predictable basis. And I think that plus um, the American experience during the 80s led a lot of uh, advisors to the Bush administration in the fall of 2001 to say, you really cannot afford uh, to repeat these errors. And, and so a whole series of decisions about the extent of engagement um, were made. And they had real consequences over the next couple of years. Yeah, I mean, Milt Bearden wrote a piece in the fall of 2001, which I think was quite influential on foreign affairs. I think it was a title, The Graveyard of Empires, mm -hmm. making that argument. And clearly, it, if you look at General Franks' bio autobiography and Rumsfeld's biography, you know, the, these ideas weighed very heavily on them, but it, it was completely a miss. It was the wrong, uh, it was, it was, they learned the wrong lessons. I mean, if you think about what the Soviets did in Afghanistan, every principle of successful counterinsurgency warfare, they essentially reversed. It was a conscript army that was looting uh, routinely. There were uh, very heavy drug and alcohol problems. Uh, they inflicted a totalitarian war on the population, and as Steve said, they faced a countrywide insurrection. It wasn't just rural pastunes, it was every class. Look at Dr. Abdullah, he's a surgeon from uh, Kabul, uh, an eye surgeon. He joined the uh, insurgency in his early 20s. And so um, we, it, it certainly was the wrong lesson. And the size of the insurgency was very different. If you look at Mark Urban's very good account of the early um, war. There's 175, Af 175 Afghans on the battlefield at any given moment. 
versus the 35,000 Taliban that there are today, if you're being generous. So it was the wrong analogy. And it, and it produced these very bad policy outcomes. And, if, and I remember tracking down Tommy Franks at the <coughs> convention, I think, in 04, when we were still at the Post. And, and he was bringing his book out at that time. And we interviewed him. And, and this question had arisen. I think uh, Kerry had raised it as a criticism of the, of the president. And, and, and the White House had deflected it to Franks. So he was the commander in chief, and he was responsible for it. And so I asked him why did you not, because one of the questions was, why didn't you send the 10th Mountain Division in? They were trained, they were altitude fighters, they were in position. The airlift might have been tricky, but that's what they were trained to do, to block either the back of the mountain or to join the assault directly on bin Laden at Tora Bora. And, he, and as I recall what he said, he said that he feared, not on the basis of direct experience, because he would have not had any, it would have been on the basis of advice, that uh, if he put men into those mountains, it, given the demography of that area, he would provoke a Pashtun rising. Mm -hmm. And that they would, it would be like Black Hawk Down, or that, you know, that they would be helpless to defend themselves, which you know, I think was a misreading. Well, I mean, that's right. We often you know, talk about the sort of light footprint. What did that mean in reality at Tora Bora, as, as, as Peter and I have often joked, but it's, it's true, unfortunately. You know, there were more American journalists boots on the ground in Tora Bora than there were American military boots on the ground. Uh, you know, and coming back to Washington, you know, people, oh, you covered the Battle of Tora Bora, so, you know, what was, well, who'd you deal with in the U.S. military? I said, you know, I never saw an American military figure in <laughs> Afghanistan <laughs> until March of 2002 during the Battle of Shahiko. That was the first time that I ever encountered any American military personnel. I did see from a distance uh, British special forces uh, who were acting as, as spotters for one group of the militia at Tora Bora, and I was um, pushed into a ditch with Geraldo Rivera, but that's as close <laughs> as I came to. <laughs> you know, so uh, it, it really was a light footprint. You know. <laughs> um, another data point, you know, the Battle of Tora Bora, by the time the Battle of Tora Bora had happened, more journalists had died in Afghanistan than American soldiers. Yeah. The first journalist to die, of course, was Johnny Spann, who yeah. was killed in yeah. the Maza Sharif uh, yeah. uprising, but the four journalists were killed on the road, on the road from, from Jalalabad to, yeah. um, to, to Kabul. So, what do we make of the fact that, you know, here we are 10, ten years later and, uh, you know, we're talking and running uh, articles today on, on the AFPAC channel, which is our joint uh, venture between foreignpolicy.com and, and the New America Foundation, on Mullah Omar, you know, still, still in charge of the Taliban. Uh, we're still talking about the Taliban 10 years later. Um, you know, we're still talking about its, you know, connections with uh, possibly, you know, reinventing itself, Al-Qaeda. Um, you know, that's got to rank as one of the big surprises. Uh, you know, sort of a Butch Cassidy story for a <laughs> new era. Well, and I think, you know, going back to that fall of 2001 where people who had been around this the civil war in the 90s had advice for the Americans going into Afghanistan after the 9-11 attacks. If, if the advice about um, Afghan public opinion and Afghan resilience in the face of an international intervention after Taliban rule was wrong. The advice about Pakistani equities in the post 9-11 settlements in, Af in Afghanistan turned out to be right because what, what's happened is that the United States failed adequately to account for Pakistan's historical hedging strategies in Afghanistan, which they had themselves <laughs> participated in throughout the 1980s. And in the, and you know, among the uh, unintended consequences of the Iraq War was the decision to essentially outsource Pakistan's um, role in the region to Pervez Musharraf, who was a, um, a really a figure of continuity in the Pakistan army and whose use of Mullah Omar and the Taliban uh, really didn't differ from predecessors or, for that matter, from successors. But the, I think the Bush administration, for lack of the resources, attention span, and strategy to do something different, um, decided just to rely on the Pakistan army as, a, as an instrument of uh, its political strategy in the region. That was the same mistake that the United States made in the 1980s. Uh, you know, you look back on the 1980s, um, 
and you say, well, what were the unforced errors that the United States made in the 1980s? Because look, I mean, we're not responsible for the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan uh, or Afghan resistance to that invasion. But what, what could the United States have done to forge a more stable Afghanistan as a, during that conflict? And one of them would have been to uh, challenge the Pakistan army's hegemony over political strategy in the war, which favored radical Islamists like Gulbuddin Hekmadiyar and others who ended up creating the ground on which al-Qaeda was incubated. And the reason the United States didn't challenge Pakistan army's sort of primacy and political strategy in the 1980s really weren't much different than, than in the 2000s. It was convenient. They were willing to do it. They had a preference uh, to do it. And so we end up with the same cycle. Do, do you think that there was an alternate course available in uh, 2001 and 2002, uh, in particular with Pakistan? Well, I don't, it's not so much the Pakistan army, but it would have been the management of the political transition in the south and east and the, and the, and the management of the Taliban um, after their overthrow. Mm -hmm. You know, with the benefit of hindsight, it's easy to see that there were many sections of the Kandahari Taliban that were on the fence as Karzai went into Kandahar. Mm -hmm. And in researching, you know, the sort of narrative of Taliban revival, uh, you certainly encounter many credible regional Taliban leaders who, and my f the most vivid story, the one that's easiest to tell, though maybe too good to check, uh, but it has a, it has a couple of uh, sources of testimony to it, was that there was a gathering of regional Taliban leaders on the outskirts of Kandahar after Karzai went in with U.S. Special Forces, took the city in December 2001, and essentially the meeting was to decide their in effect, their surrender policy or their reintegration uh, strategy. And um, somebody raised their hand and said, asked a question of the, of the assembled Taliban leaders. Well, after we become part of the Karzai government, uh, as ex-ministers, will, will we be entitled to car allowances? <laughs> you know, just sort of like this was the most normal thing in Afghan politics. You just kind of flip over, you become part of the new government. And instead, we installed in uh, Kandahar, in part because of the light footprint strategy, because we were uh, basically a bunch of warlords who had a predatory attitude toward all the Absolutely. Taliban, who had thrown them all out, and who chased them down and sold them for bounty to send them to Guantanamo. And you started a pattern in which there was no, everybody was uh, lumped into the same uh, category. Taliban leadership, Taliban middle level, uh, Taliban uh, local kind of accidental guerrilla commanders and that policy which was not dis uh, discriminating enough in the first place was given over to proxy warlords whose outlook was not discriminating at all. Well that's right and then just to go back to Pakistan for a second I want to get your your views on that as well because you know I think on the one hand right you sketched out the reasons that were very similar in the 1980s and uh, in the immediate aftermath of 2001. We have a built-in partner in the Pakistani security establishment. They have the relationships. But what I find so extraordinary is that having, A, gone through that experience in the 1980s, but B, this is with the Pakistani establishment pretty explicitly over those first few months of American engagement in 2001, continuing to play both sides in a way that was very transparent and available to anyone, you know, both journalists and also senior American policymakers. I mean, you know, I can not forget the scene of visiting the family of a Pakistani martyr who was killed uh, in the battle for Mazar-e-Sharif. Uh, you know, you could just drive around, uh, you know, within 20 minutes, a half an hour of Islamabad and find, you know, literally hundreds and hundreds of families uh, that had sent their sons off to the war uh, in the aftermath of uh, September 11th in Afghanistan. The government of Pakistan knew full well this was happening. They were facilitating the return uh, of as many of them as they could once the Americans marched in. So it, it wasn't like, well, gee, you know, we have this built-in reliable partner. I mean, they, they had this. Well, you know, in the United States, I mean, uh, Peter, you should jump in. I don't want to, um, but I'll just try this once. I mean. Obviously, the United States was credulous about Musharraf and the Pakistan army. Many of the um, 
folks in the Bush administration's first term cabinet, even the ones who had some personal experience of Pakistan, which were, who were very few as a percentage of the cabinet. I mean, this, this was a cabinet full of uh, mostly men who would have been equipped to deal with a crisis in the former Soviet Union or the Middle East or maybe even Japan or China, but South Asia was a fairly obscure uh, specialty before 9-11 and the cabinet basically had a few people like Armitage and Colin Powell whose entire experience of the region was in liaison with the Pakistan army. So they, and they, and they regarded the Pakistan army correctly as a pro relatively professional cohesive army, surprisingly cohesive given the political economy in which it was set. They found it as a, a useful partner in the first Gulf War, so they went back to it and said, you're, you're going to be our instrument, you're going to be our partner. And obviously there was a great deal of credulousness or a failure to look seriously at how the army regarded its own interests. We don't have to be sort of moralistic about this. The Pakistan army had a view of its interests in its neighborhood that was different than the one the United States wished it to have. And because that was inconvenient, the United States looked past that problem and then over-invested in the personality of Musharraf, who after all seemed so secular and could speak a good game and made a lot of promises. And as you say, it didn't really require deep investigation to see that there was a duality in the way the Pakistan army managed its relationship with the United States. It said what it needed to say to the United States and then it managed its own interests as quietly and, and as it could. Now, the problem really, even today, after May, after Abbottabad, is that when we discovered that the Pakistan army regarded its own interests in a way differently than we would wish it to, we got really angry. <laughs> and we, now we've overlearned the lesson on the other side, you know, as if uh, really by being shocked at our own inability to see what was obvious, now we're going to construct a policy that's based on, you know, sort of firmness in the other direction. It's, it's part of this pendulum in U.S.-Pakistan relations over 40 or 50 years that is really quite unhealthy on both sides, but self-defeating for the United States above all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that takes us right to the present day and American-Pakistani relations. What, you know, do you think this is sort of cursed by history to be in the place that it is right now, or? You know, I mean, obviously it, uh, it's bad. I think we have a 12% favorable rating in Pakistan right now, which is down from 17%, so it's the lowest it's ever been. Uh, but we've usually been below 20, so I mean, uh, it's one of the most anti-American countries in the world and has been so for a long time. Uh, you know, in practice, does that make a big difference uh, to what goes on on the CT front? We saw on Friday that Mauritani was arrested in a joint U.S.-Pakistani uh, operation. I think at the sort of elite level, there's a kind of understanding that Uyghur's marriage had better succeed because for all sorts of obvious reasons. Certainly in Congress on the Hill, there's a lot of uh, opposition to the relationship and the desire to cut aid. and. And certainly in Pakistan, I think I was just in Pakistan in July. I was at the National Defense University, and I was the designated pinata uh, for a, a set of uh, um, for about a, a half a day uh, for basically a laundry list of anti-American complaints uh, that uh, stretch back a very long way. Um, I mean, and and just to, in terms of what Steve said, I mean, I think the idea that that we should understand somebody's strategic interests better than they do is crazy. And this has been really our problem, is that we think that actually if, they, if only they understood their real strategic interests, that, 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 you know, that they would finally change their policies in a way that would make sense. Well, I think people understand their own strategic interests better than anybody else. And I think if you've lost three and a half or, or drawn three and a half wars with your neighbor, um, that's going to continue. If we'd lost three and a half wars with Canada over the last 60 years or drawn, I think we'd be pretty preoccupied by Canada. So um, they're not going to change their strategic interests. And um, I think the enemy of the perfect is not the reasonably okay. I think that at the end of the day, the operations in southern Waziristan and SWAT were, you know, they weren't, uh, you know, talk about something that was a little unpredictable. In 2003, if we'd had this conversation, and say that there'd be major Pakistani military operations, quite successful ones, against the Taliban and SWAT and South Waziristan, uh, that was not something that would have been predictable. So for all the sort of sturm and drang about our relationship with Pakistan, there are a lot of um, kind of underlying strengths in the society which I think get lost in all this. One is um, we're probably going to see the first civilian government in Pakistani history complete its term. Two, there's a very independent press. There's a relatively independent judiciary. They had their Arab Spring. 
uh, before the Arab Spring was even a thought in the Middle East. They got rid of the military dictator. I mean, there's, and as Anatole Levin, who's a fellow here, has written an, uh, you know, a book on Pakistan that kind of explains that there are sort of hidden strengths in Pakistani society that keep this thing afloat, whether it's remittances or the ethnic and tribal structure. And so, you know, probably Pakistan will continue to muddle through. Their economic problems are serious. Um, and that might force a sort of, the problem is there's never been a big enough crisis for Pakistan to really put its house in order. Because just, uh, there always, you know, something comes along that um, saves them, uh, whether it's an IMF bailout or whatever. But, um, you know, the relationship uh, can only get better. So let me, let me um, try to ask you a question, Susan, and kind of pull us out of South Asia, but because I was thinking about, uh, as the editor of Foreign Policy, um, there was a pretty good, there have been a whole series of pretty good arguments about 9-11 over the last couple of weeks in different places, and one that really um, I, I found the most provocative was by Philip Stevens in the Financial Times, and he essentially argued that 9-11 didn't matter because if you really step back from an American perspective, certainly from a global perspective, and asked, you know, what happened in the last 10 years that anyone's going to remember um, in, a, in a large way, you would say, rise of China, rise of the rest, decline of relative American power, and uh, rise of middle classes all over uh, those India, China, Brazil, elsewhere. And that this would have happened anyway. And that it basically also created the environment in which the financial crisis occurred because of the global imbalances that led to uh, the American housing boom and bust. And so really, if we were to think about these 10 years, um, apart from uh, the victims and participants in the conflicts that were generated by 9-11, it was a sidebar. Yeah, no, it's interesting you raise that. that that's of all of the 9-11 coverage which, which we've had on our site and, and everyone else has. Um, that was, we, we ran a piece that was very similar, uh, sort of a list of here's 10 things that are more significant uh, than September 11th that, that have happened in the last decade. And, you know, the rise of China, the rise of the rest and middle classes, uh, the emergence of social networking and sort of technological wiring of globalization uh, you know, we're, we're on that list. And, you know, if you take the really long view, it's, it's actually hard to argue that point, uh, right? At the same time that um, the war on terror was being launched by the United States, right? You know, you were literally having the largest emergence from poverty into the middle class in, in the history of the world in terms of numbers of people in a, in a short time span. That's, you know, it's pretty hard to argue with that. Um, you know, in a, in a big picture view. I mean, I, the most persuasive case about why it matters, right, is also on some level the most depressing, which is um, looking at in the context of a sort of late imperial overstretch and that, you know, to the extent that it would merit its own chapter in the, in the history books 50 or 100 years from now, uh, it, it certainly seems plausible that it could be in that chapter. One thing I've always been struck by is, and this gets to your point about Iraq, and that we do end up having to look at these events together. The astonishing and extraordinary growth of the American military budget over the course of that 10 years um, to fight those wars, and the fact that we are left at the end of this decade uh, with U.S. military expenditures constituting something like, I'm going to get the numbers wrong, but something like 46 percent of all global military expenditures. Uh, it's just it's just astonishing, right? And that is a growth that, it, you know, might be an anticipated consequence, right? That's what big bureaucracies do when faced with a, uh, a shattering event like September 11th. They, you know, find a lot of reasons to, to grow their turf. But that strikes me as, as something that may well last with yeah. us, even if it's not more important than, you know, the sort of China's economic explosion. Yeah, you know, I was thinking about that this morning in anticipation of this because I agree with the kind of late imperial overstretch sort of framing. 9-11 might have provoked um, an extension of something that was building up anyway. But it's interesting to ask, I mean, maybe uh, this is a little bit twisted of a logic chain, but was the Iraq war really provoked by 
or was it inevitable that the West, including Tony Blair and the United States, would overinterpret um, their position in the world and overstretch the potential of expeditionary land armies somewhere <laughs> uh, for some reason. I mean, essentially you had, why did, why did the United States believe that the costs of invading Iraq would be so low? How did it make such a terrible miscalculation? Well, the, the um, first Gulf War, uh, the immaculate intervention in, uh, against Serbia Kosovo. over Kosovo, uh, Various other painless interventions in, you know, Sierra Leone by the British Army, the, the sort of sense that the world melts away before this expeditionary technological uh, power, the intervention against the Taliban, uh, which was also another immaculate intervention. Uh, and so, you know, even without 9-11, wouldn't the United States have had to learn the hard lessons that we thought we had learned in Vietnam, that there are limits to conventional military superiority, especially in the age of globalization and nationalism, and that you simply cannot um, accomplish what some of these interventions suggested in all settings at all times. And so you ought to be very careful about undertaking them. Well, and this gets to the, the war on terror framing uh, and context in which, you know, that Iraq invasion occurred, right? You know, this is something you and I were, were talking about. Yeah, you know, I think on the imperial overstretch, you could make a kind of counter-argument. You could say that there was actually a giant Keynesian pump for the American economy, in fact. Because, I mean, there's, there's this kind of narrative that al-Qaeda has this diabolically clever plan to r rob us uh, economically, which is sort of post facto rationalization of their own failures, in fact. And, is, and, and also al-Qaeda members generally aren't economists. And uh, in fact, you know, if, you know, it's not an accident that five out of the ten richest counties in, in the United States surround this city. And just as World War II was a giant sort of Keynesian pump, and so was Vietnam. But in terms of the war framing, um, I mean, just as a matter of percentage of GDP that we spend on our military, we're only spending 4.5 percent now. And we're only spending 1 percent in Afghanistan, even despite the huge amount of money we are spending. In Vietnam in 1968, we spent 9%. And in World War II, we spent 40 percent. So, you know, this is a very kind of strange war in the sense that it, you know, there's no draft, uh, there's relatively little public expenditure, there's almost no public attention to the war in a sense. Certainly in Afghanistan, it's just people have tuned it out. Um, and I think that, and as a general proposition, if we, if by historical standards, this is not a very significant war of any kind. Uh, look at the Civil War; it almost destroyed the country. Um, uh, you know, and so I think we will look back on this time as a time of relative peace and. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and probably um, relative lack of prosperity. <laughs> uh, but it, it, you know, it, it, this is not, a, and so in terms of the war framing, um, you know, one of the, it, it's, it's a very strange kind of war where, you know, where there's only 17 Americans who die in the last decade as a result of people motivated by this ideology. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right to challenge some of the, I mean, I didn't, wasn't actually intending it as an economic overstretch, but just right. that inevitably we would oh, right, right. we would right. send a, an army abroad and fail right. in the way that we did in Iraq. But, but I think you know on the economic argument, I mean you know as Dirksen would have said if he'd still been around, a trillion here, a trillion there, eventually <laughs> it adds up. I mean uh, you know if you look at the total uh, sort of consequences of tax cuts, two expeditionary wars, and the financial crisis, then yes, the wars figure only as a, you know, minority element of the total pain uh, and certainly aren't as significant as the tax cuts. But, you know, they do, they are part of a, of a whole, of a sort of sense of America's place in the world. What are America's opportunities? What should be its investments? Where should it be thinking about, is, are we correctly perceiving our, um, our strategy with an eye on the next 20 or 30 years and the generations that we should be, and are we correctly uh, analyzing the costs and benefits of certain responses to threats? Because there are threats, and there were threats, and even Iraq was a threat. But how do you manage your response to those threats in the context of a correct understanding of your place in the world? And that's the overstretch, I think, you know, that, that we might, that, that basically the success of the first Gulf War, Kosovo, and and even the intervention against the Taliban was so rapidly over and disastrously overlearned. Well, I think you know one of the most interesting sort of arguments I've I've, I've heard surfaced 
lately in the context of the Arab Spring is that, in fact, a consequence not to see this as perhaps the Bush administration might want you to as a sort of like, okay, somewhat delayed from what we want, but ultimately in some way a vindication of our scenario that, you know, democracy once reintroduced to the Middle East, uh, you know, will, will prove to be inexorable. I, the counter argument to that is a very interesting one, which is that in fact it's our misadventures and our really muddled strategic thinking over the last decade that have postponed. You know, I if you see the democratization and the wave of change in, in the Middle East as the inevitable but very delayed consequence of what should have happened in the late 1980s and early 1990s uh, as part of that third wave of democratization that was occurring elsewhere around the world at the same time. And actually it was the reaction to the heavy-handed and sort of misguided application both of American force and the perceived sort of ideological um, dimension to that in the context of the Middle East uh, that actually delayed the Arab Spring by, you know, a decade or more. I, I think that's a very interesting, and then you begin to see the consequences of, of a lost generation, for example, of uh, Arab youth who are not only fueling these uh, popular street revolts today in the Middle East, but arguably are going to pose a long-term challenge because where our interests may temporarily converge, you know, behind these very attractive slogans, it's hard to see that these, that these folks are going to, in the long term, you know, have a pretty, a, a common set of interests with those of the United States in, in the region. Um, so, you know, I, I think that's a really interesting thing. And, and to me, that goes back to this question about the framing of we're launching a global war on terror. Was that, A, an inevitable response um, by an American uh, national security establishment to the sort of shattering terror of September 11th, and then B, uh, why is it persisted so long? It's, it's been with us for 10 years. Uh, is it finally over? I thought, Are we, we, I thought, we, were, I thought we had <laughs> outlawed the war on no, terror. We're now what? at and war against al Qaeda. It was revived. And, you know, it? Obama it has made efforts uh, to recast it or to eliminate that branding. So that's the other question. Is it really dead or does it live on? Oh. I think President Obama faced a, an interesting choice when he came into office, which was how to frame it. And he said, you know, he. I've never heard him use the phrase the war on terror, and he framed it as a war on al-Qaeda and its allies, which I think is useful on many levels. Names the enemy, it's not a tactic. Suggests if you de-ally yourself from al-Qaeda, we're not at war with you. In a sense, it was sort of the opposite of saying you're either with us or, or against us. I mean, it would have been much more powerful to Bush, for Bush to say anybody who's against these guys is with us, right? That would have been a much more inclusive, and, and we wouldn't have had some of the problems that we had in the first Bush term. So, you know, I mean, to, he could have, Obama could have said, hey, it's a, Global police action against terrorists, which is certainly what liberals on the Democratic side of the party, um, the liberal Democrats would have wanted, or certain people in Europe. But you know, Al Qaeda is at war with us, and sort of pretend otherwise would be would be, I think, naive. And it, we are in a war. It's just it's not a war with a very exact. It's, I mean, Steve and I have had this conversation, I think, many times and in various ways. I mean, the problem is the terminology for the war doesn't precisely exist. I mean, war is a sort of much too expansive uh, framework, but a uh, law enforcement exercise is much too smaller framework. And it's something that, you know, the war against the Barbary pirates is perhaps the nearest that we have had in American history that is similar. Do you think that um, Al Qaeda today, uh, you know, I mean, do we have a new set of definitions for what that enemy is, whether it's a war or not, you know, casting forward, clearly they are, we're still engaged in a, you know, sort of struggle against them, that it's not solely confined uh, to Pakistan and the borderlands with Afghanistan, but it obviously has, you know, elements in, in Africa and that sort of thing. It's, it exists on the internet in, in a new way. What's your post Bin Laden uh, raid view of, of Al Qaeda now? Well, it's always had those characteristics, hasn't it? I mean, you, you mentioned those things because you've been working on them for as long as Al-Qaeda has been on the radar screen. And so it's always been a blended phenomenon, very complicated, very hard to draw firm borders around. So it, it has had a core leadership and aspired to hold a core leadership from the beginning. And that's the simplest thing to describe, but that's not ever what it's always been. I mean, that's never been... Uh, its entirety. So it's always also been a network of like-minded groups. Now that gets a little bit fuzzy because you have to decide if you're fighting a war against Al-Qaeda and its allies, which allies are your enemy and which are, are you neutral about and, and which might you be able to convert to your cause. And that, as in all wars against 
coalitions is a dynamic process. So the Libyan Islamic fighting group was on the other side and then became neutral and got flipped and, and so on. And, and so the allies today are more important relative to the center because the center has been so badly degraded by US direct action. The allies now are popping up in places like um, Yemen and Somalia where they're strengthening themselves. And then you have this other characteristic of Al Qaeda that I'm not sure has a lot of precedent um, except in the history of terrorism. I mean, I'm not sure that even pirates or other things quite have mm -hmm. the model of a global move, self described global movement in which leaders incite individuals to act separate from uh, leadership without it necessarily any contact with leadership, uh, kind of guerrillas in place, wherever they may be, and inspire them to, to attack certain targets for certain reasons and then claim credit for them. So that idea of the, uh, and the internet has obviously facilitated uh, that aspect of Al-Qaeda's sense of itself as a vanguard, to stimulate an uprising by individuals who are inspired by the cause. And so, you know, those things will persist. I'm afraid they'll be around for a long time. They may, those characteristics of the way this organization has acted, the way it's carried out its violence, the way it's sought funding and recruits, we may see that structure adapted by groups with completely different ideologies over time. I don't think, you know, Islamist globalized radicals have a monopoly on really clever media driven asymmetric strategies i'm sure you know we'll find others who will who will do that whether they'll have the same traction in the world another ideology might be more more appealing maybe uh, yeah i mean you know i i i mark sageman uh, the great you know sort of provocative uh, terrorism analyst who's who's uh, you know kid who had like a doctorate at 13 he's just one of those people whose head is not quite large enough to contain his brain and i remember he <laughs> He came over to my house for uh, uh, brunch at some point, like 2004, 2005, and he brought his son, who was a young, maybe like 12. And uh, while we were talking about all this sort of thing, having the kind of conversation that we're having now, uh, he said, oh, I'm quite sure my son will be a terrorist. <laughs> my son was sitting there eating like a bagel on the chair. And he barely looked up. I think his father says this about him all the time. And, uh, <laughs> And I said, well, what do you mean? He's obviously not going to become an Islamist radical. And he said, no, no. But I'm thinking maybe eco-terrorist, you know, that their generation will evolve some view of the harm that uh, powerful interests are doing to the planet or the next generation after his, and they will fight back in some guerrilla capacity, and then they'll adapt uh, all of, hey, that's actually a pretty good transition, Peter. <laughs> to your Our database. database. <laughs> <laughs> and it was completely <laughs> unintended. <laughs> so, yes, We're about right. to release a database in the next uh, 24 to 40 hours, 48 hours, which will look at um, forms of political violence in, in, in the United States since 9-11 that have got nothing to do with Al-Qaeda or bin Laden's ideas. And, and one of the interesting takeaways going to the eco-terrorist uh, Mark Sageman Jr. is that if there is a radiological bomb attack or a chemical or biological it's much more likely to come out of the anarchists or the right wing. There have been five mm -hmm. cases that we've uh, documented um, uh, since 9-11 of people either assembling the materials for a radiological weapon or, or a chemical or a biological. And, uh, well, of course, Bruce Ivins, his motivations were a little obscure, but let's say they were anti-government and anti-journalist since he uh, mailed, them at, uh, mailed them to political figures and journalists. So uh, certainly the record suggests that um, there are lots of other forms of political violence, radical veg vegetarians armed with nuclear weapons or something will <laughs> alarm us in the future. But the, uh, I wanted to get to the question of where Al-Qaeda is today. Yes. You know, I mean, they're becoming irrelevant. And there are Marxist-Leninists still somewhere on campuses in Michigan, probably, or somewhere in the, in the United States. But just, no one is paying any attention to them. And I think one of the really striking takeaways from bin Laden's death was the total absence of protests. Uh, around the Muslim world, mm -hmm. where there were, you know, think about the million man protests about the Iraq war mm -hmm. in a Jakarta in two th before, uh, before the invasion, or in Karachi. I mean, you know, in, in Pakistan, there were um, at most a couple of hundred people in Quetta protested. And this is not impressive uh, in a country of 180 million people. So I think that the, the war of ideas was being lost by Al Qaeda long before the Arab Spring, long before the death of bin Laden. These two big events have just accelerated it further. There will still be takers for his ideas. They're just fewer and fewer. Well, so then, 
what do we think about, you started us out actually with this question, which is, uh, it's extraordinary and are we surprised by the fact that there have been so few acts of Islamic jihadist specifically inspired successful terrorism in the United States in this last ter 10 years. Uh, do we think there are, uh, you know, a whole new wave of sort of follow-on al-Qaeda that, that exists in some meaningful way as a threat, or did we overinflate the threat uh, from the beginning? 9-11 was the climax of al-Qaeda's activities, not the beginning, but it was misinterpreted by most of the people right. in the political class as, as the beginning of the campaign, but it was the end of it, in fact. And, that, so, and they were very surprised by, by this event because it didn't fit with our various worldviews. And the kind of people who've been following this in more detail were less surprised. There mm -hmm. were, uh, we all know who they were. So it was kind of a category error, and they inflated it into the same, f you know, Bush was talking about it, being bracketing it with the fight against fascism and communism, which didn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. And if the Cold War had ended with a bang instead of a whimper, we would all be not having this conversation. Uh, mm -hmm. So, I mean, that was, you know, the, the, they mistook it. Mm -hmm. Well, and I, I think I agree with that, except when I think back on that period, um, even when, with the benefit of all the records, the 9-11 Commission and even in the small circle of you know, Dick Clark and a few others who, who basically had all the evidence and had interpreted it correctly. It was reasonable, in my judgment, looking even in hindsight, to be uncertain for about six or eight months as to mm -hmm. whether or not the cells that had carried out 9-11 had other, had, whether there were other cells of that quality. Right. Basically, you know, were, was this, the very best A team that they had, and they had hit a moonshot, or were there five or six or seven other A teams? Because after all, it, had, it turned out it was fairly easy for them to infiltrate into the United <laughs> States and sit still without being detected for a long time. And there were immediate reports to the president from law enforcement saying, you know, we're thinking there's probably half a dozen other of these cells. Uh, now that turned out to be wrong, and it took them uh, six or eight months to figure that out. Now, after that, then I believe the kind of extrapolation and the category errors and the rest yeah. of it are pretty much sustainably unforgivable. But I think it took a while to, to get to that. Maybe give them a year or, or right. whatever you want to do. But, but of course, it took much longer than a year for them to then build a gigantic uh, intelligence bureaucracy around you know the maintenance and therefore the puffing up of the threat, you know, which right. is then totally you have all on kinds a different of other time sources frame. of momentum yeah. coming in. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, does that mean that right now we are potentially, you know, still looking in at events in the framework of our own last ten years' experience? I mean, that's what worries me actually. Is that uh, it's become too easy for us to say, well, uh, you know, in the prism uh, that again has so much uh, to do with the sort of misconceptions that, that informed our invasion of Iraq as well. I mean, it's very hard, right, to have a conversation about this and to separate out our, our views of uh, Afghanistan from our views of Iraq, from our views of, you know, the war against al-Qaeda. And so, uh, you know, are we too shaped in, in how we're thinking of these things because of that particular experience? Well, I mean, it could be. I mean, I think, look, if you look at the record, just look at the patterns and the, and the dots on the, on the last 10 years. I don't think you can be complacent about the, the, the potential threat or the potential to miss one or to, to have a huge consequential surprise. I mean, there are on that record um, individuals like Major Hassan who were inspired despite having no contact with trainers to carry out murderous acts on a certain scale, but they, sh in our culture, in our media-saturated culture, inevitably they shock the system. Uh, one guy, similarly, maybe he did have direct training and contact, but it was of a fairly low level. He parks a, a car in Times Square and it doesn't work, okay? So uh, there's another guy on a plane and he, he, his thing doesn't go off. All right, well, I mean, you look at those dots, the probabilities over time, if individuals are continually inspired to carry out such acts, one of them will pop. Uh, and then we will be challenged to respond to that collectively, individually, through our government and otherwise. And are we really prepared for that moment? I doubt it. I mean, I, I think we're, we will overreact again. And, uh, and the scale of such an attack 
I don't think you can easily consign it just to one SUV with some explosives in the back of, of a Times Square summer night. I mean, there are talented, motivated groups in Karachi and in Pakistan that if uh, enabled and if lucky and if really determined, we saw what they did in Mumbai. You know, if, all right, yes, the United States is a pretty hard target to get into as a Pakistani young man <laughs> with a rucksack. I mean, you can't serve up, you know, you can't turn up at your average airport and <laughs> kind of walk through the way you could before 9-11. But look, it's, it's a big, wide world. It's got a lot of holes in it. And if you're really smart and really good, I mean, it wasn't that easy to get into Mumbai, but those guys trained. They, they had a plan. They were ruthless. They, you know, they hijacked a ship murdered the captain and s sailed right into harbor. So things can happen. And they had a state sponsor. They had a, they, had a, they had a state sponsor, or a quasi-state sponsor anyway. And the, uh, so, you know, there's, it is quite likely that the United States will be attacked by terrorists over the next 10 or 20 years. Um, I think it's almost certain. The question is, what will the degree of success be uh, and how will we respond to it? I think what is much less likely, almost to the vanishing point, is that those attackers um, could achieve effects, you know, on the scale of 9/11. I just, it, I think it would be very that that, that conspiracy. You think about it, the, the, the timelines and yeah. the resources and the ex, the kind of entrails of that conspiracy. I think it would be much more likely to be attacked. That, that raises an interesting question, which is 9/11. We can probably say that was a national security problem for the United States. It is, you know, is the kind of threat you're describing a kind of second order threat that essentially is Oklahoma City or Pan Am 103, which were pretty, I mean, in the post 9-11 era, a, a Pan Am 103 looks a lot bigger and probably in the post 9-11 era, an Oklahoma City looks mm -hmm. a lot bigger. But does it really rise to a 9, I mean, if Flight 253 had blown up over Detroit, it wouldn't be Pan Am 103, it would have been something bigger, right. even though the death toll would have been roughly similar. So Right, the escalation effect of having had this one experience. I mean, because I actually, I think I would disagree. I mean, although I think on any given day, right, you know, there are, these capacities exist in the world, you know, borders are porous enough, and, you know, our own instincts and reflexes, if, if, if anything, have geared us up to be, you know, sort of more potentially hysterical in our response, including <laughs> politically. I mean, you know, look at what the, the earthquake did to us <laughs> here in Washington, uh, you know, a <laughs> couple weeks ago. I mean, you know, imagine, uh, I think, especially in this hypercharged political atmosphere that we're in right now, um, you know, where you have uh, already a nearly toxic atmosphere between the president and uh, uh, a Congress of a different party. I, you know, it would be very frightening to contemplate, you know, what, you know, the sort of this occurred on Obama's watch <laughs> narrative through a whole campaign would be. And I, I actually do agree with Peter that because of the change in our thinking about it in the elevation of this to a uh, immediate national security crisis as opposed to potentially sort of terrible one-off incident, um, you know, a plane being shot down or, you know, some new new kind of, you know, attack here in, in Washington, um, you know, the immediate elevation of that into, you know, sort of uh, enormous sort of like soul searching, like, you know, was this, you know, have we been thinking about it, it all wrong and actually the Bush administration was right and we've been wrong. I mean, I, I think. So that's what I'm saying. I'm yeah. saying we, we will overreact. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. No, yeah. I'm agreeing <laughs> with yeah. you. I'm agreeing with I'm you, but I'm thinking that the that, that, that possibilities and the chances of that attack, unfortunately, are um, are very good. Potentially, yeah. you know, much higher than. But the question for both Steve uh, and Susan. I mean, to what extent is the media responsible, or, or for for that, in the sense that you know, when Pan Am 103 went up, there were very few pictures when it went went down in mm -hmm. Scotland. Today, there'd be sort of quasi live coverage and people tweeting about it, and there'd be a whole different. Yeah, but I mean, it's it, the problem with that is it's structural. What are you going to do? I mean, right. you're going to you're going to ban the digital revolution. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, I'm not suggesting that. You know, but and and so the 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 reason there were fewer pictures when Pan Am uh, one or three, there were quite a lot of pictures. Yeah. I think relative to people's information, it would be interesting, you know, for some PhD thesis to go back and mark a few of these television media driven episodes and kind of gauge the degree to which they really did saturate consciousness and how that fed reactions and so forth. But um, to the extent that there was less noise, less information in the system in 1983, it was because uh, 
um, media was licensed on finite spectrum with a few quasi-governmental networks in, in possession of the authority. And then that created a smaller world of decision makers who could maybe be influenced or more self-regulating with consequence. Now there's, there's you know, you could self-regulate all day long and you're not going to change the way technology brings information to audiences. So. Well, it's, you know, it's a really interesting question too though because actually having lived in a country, Russia, which was actually undergoing a very constant uh, war in which you know terror attacks you know were a, a very regular presence in Moscow in the period in which I lived there uh, you know which is much more similar to say what Israelis have lived through at various periods than it is anything you know we've had a lot of this discussion and debate has been you know virtual in the case of the United States we have not actually been a society under attack you know which was the sort of right was not the Chiron on, on CNN you know America under attack you know um, for a long time actually after September 11th and you know but actually it was that attack and then a lot of worrying and you know discussion yeah. about it and what was interesting was you know Russia obviously is not as me media saturated of a society as um, the one we're living in there's much more heavy-handed state control of television and that sort of thing that being said people you know really had the possibility of knowing about these attacks in Moscow you know wave after wave really horrendous things happened uh, and people's resilience, people's ability to live in those circumstances is well documented, uh, whether it's in the former Soviet Union or in, in Israel. So were we to face the actual threatened but not yet realized, you know, war of terrorism on our soil, um, you know, I guess is we would, we would come to terms with it in some way. And I, yeah, I feel certain that the American people would be resilient yeah. in the face of a, a true repeated threat, that they would adapt to it, that they would yeah. place it in context. And it, what's perverse about what we're describing yeah. is that <laughs> it's actually, it's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a <laughs> psychological, yeah, you know, media, virtual uh, wave of, of perceptions without real learning. Because, you know, if you look at India today, uh, Indian society, they, they, somebody blew themselves up in front of the uh, New Delhi high, high Court today, or at the at security checkpoint. Now, those kinds of events barely make American media. They occur every couple or three months, and Indian society has adapted to the point where um, even the politics of terrorism are quite different from the militancy that you might assume, that there is a sense that voters want governments to put terrorism into perspective, to be vigilant against it, to be aggressive where possible, but not to be irrational. And they, for example, rewarded Manmohan Singh after um, Mumbai precisely because he showed restraint and didn't start uh, the fourth war with Pakistan. And, you know, Britain and its politics offer a similar narrative each country is distinct, but the United States has not been tested in the way that the headlines on cable television would suggest that we've been tested, unfortunately. And fortunately, because it means we haven't lost lives. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Should we, I, I think we'd yeah. love to bring you into the, uh, into the conversation too. We'll do questions. Just please give us your name and, and who you're with. and. Make it a question, if you can, rather and than wait for a, the mic. a Andrew's statement. Got the yes, mic. Andrew's here with a mic. Um, we'll start with this uh, lady here in the front. Thank you very much. Did that work? It'll, it'll, if you keep yeah, going, it'll, it'll pick up, I think. Thank you very much. I'm Lynn Soraya. Uh, I have two quick questions. Uh, one, uh, do you think Iraq uh, intentionally was uh, are going into Iraq? We were intentionally using the foot stream of Afghanistan to move into Iraq. And two, uh, all the, there, we've often heard the identify, identification of the importance of the diaspora from South Asia, particularly Pakistan, in we should be engaging it more. Uh, why do you think we haven't actually engaged it more, both here and then working with our partners like uh, in Britain and their very large diaspora? You want to take the... Well, I'm, I'm not sure that the diaspora isn't engaged. I mean, it depends where you are. I mean, look at the Los Angeles Police Department or, or um, the sheriff of L.A. County, um, Sh Sheriff Buka. You know, I mean, his uh, engagement with the Muslim American community is regarded by a model by all sides. 
Um, so I think it, you know, there, there's plenty of, I mean, in Dearborn, Michigan, there's a lot of engagement between the government and the U.S. Attorney of Eastern Michigan and all the different political officials and the police chief and, you know, there's a lot of very good engagement. So the problem is, you know, there's a lot of different Muslim communities in this country and, and some of them are not living the American dream. Most of them are, have higher in incomes and higher and better educations than most Americans. But certainly if you're a, a Somali American li living in Cedar Riverside neighborhood in Minneapolis, which is one of the poorest neighborhoods in the country, you're not living the American dream and that's why you may be tempted to this fantasy of going to Somalia to be part of the jihad. But even there, you know, the, the government now has a, com you know, a, a strategy to combat violent extremism, which is not very, they haven't defined it particularly well. And part of they're trying to avoid some of the mistakes the British made, which was to make it entirely about law enforcement. But their view is, you know, you can engage, let's say, in Cedar Riverside with the Department of Education if people are, if there are truancy problems. You can engage with Health and Human Services. Uh, if there are people who are refugees. And so there are a lot of ways to engage with the community that aren't just about law enforcement. And I think there's a lot more thinking about it in the last couple of years uh, by the Obama administration. Um, and they're trying to avoid some of the pitfalls the British made, which was just to kind of make it mostly about a law enforcement approach to the Muslim community. What about the Iraq question? Well, I mean, obviously we were talking before about the ways in which the reaction to 9-11 was um, interpreted by the, by let's say it's President Bush's responsibility, he was the president, and he created a framework that um, accommodated uh, what were, we now know, very early discussions about invading Iraq without any empirical evidence that Al-Qaeda was in Iraq. And so that just sort of speaks for itself. But you know, the frame was even larger than that. It also was meant to facilitate um, deeper engagement with the government of Colombia against the FARC and so forth. I mean, to the extent, that I think there's still history to be unearthed about exactly how this framing <coughs> evolved on a global basis. There's been a fair amount of investigation about how the, the sort of Casas Belli in Iraq evolved inside the administration, but there hasn't been as much attention for, to the, the history of how these choices were arrived at and articulated. And, you know, I have heard people say in defense of the decision to embrace the global war on terrorism, well, we kept getting this advice that it couldn't be a global war on Muslims. So we were trying to think of an alternative. <laughs> and the advantage of the global war on terrorism was that there were a lot of terrorists who were non-Muslims so we could attack them all. Well, okay, uh, that might have been well motivated, but it wasn't a good result. So, Steve, I mean, Doug Fife, because I think, as you say, there's a lot of history still to be written about this. And, you know, George W. Bush's biography doesn't really help us with an mm. explanation of why he decided at the end. Mm. But Doug Fife, I think, got maybe as close as I've seen, and maybe it's not a perfect answer, which is essentially this was a demonstration project. I mean, if you even thinking about doing anything that might remotely inconvenience us, we're going to, you're going to pay a huge cost. That, that's the... Well, that was certainly the vice president's right. view. Well, yeah. But what's striking, though, is that, you know, they went to great lengths not only to have the broader positioning of, you know, a fine demonstration project that you could debate. You're talking about the, the Iraq war now. Politi yeah. Politically, but they explicitly went out of their way to overstate, misstate, and, you know, put on the record a very s sort of dubious, explicit connection between, uh, or implied explicit connection between the attacks of September 11th and the reason that we're going to war in Iraq, which is, uh, you know, I think that's where history is, is going to judge them most harshly. And, you know, I remember, as, as, as we all do, being in Kuwait in the run-up to the war in Iraq and, you know, seeing those, you know, soldiers in the desert who were busy, their preparation for the war at their air base was to write on the side of the bombs they were about to drop uh, in, inside Iraq, you know, this is for New York, uh, you know, you know, payback for 9-11 and, and all those slogans on there. So, you know, it wasn't implicit. It was an explicit series of, of claims that, you know, obviously were, were well, and, and it's the same thing with the WMD piece, which yeah. was that different members of the Bush right. cabinet, including the president, had different reasons for invading Iraq. <laughs> right. What they all wanted to do was invade Iraq. And then they needed to... <laughs> they came together they, under that well, they, But then they needed, a, I mean, literally not to be too, you know, sort of <laughs> cynical about it, but they needed a, a narrative to unify them around decisions that they'd actually made for quite disparate reasons. They actually didn't all agree on why they were invading Iraq, they just agreed that they were invading Iraq. <laughs> and so then, so then WMD and 9-11 and became, 
the unifying narrative that could be the, the external relations strategy that brought them together. And the, and the problem was that it rested on a lie and, or a false assumption that they would be vindicated once they got to Iraq and discovered that there was WMD there. If they had discovered that there was WMD, then the whole narrative might have uh, stitched together. But it, yeah, I think it was that they required a plausible unifying external narrative for decisions that they'd made for very diverse reasons. OK, we've been very patient here in the front, and then I'll try to get to some people in the back. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ilan Jerno from the Ayn Rand Institute. I'm interested in your thoughts on America's reaction to terrorism, uh, but from uh, backed by Iran, so groups like Hezbollah since 9-11, because I think that's something that sort of went under the radar since Iraq and Afghanistan became f the focus of our attention. Well, I mean, you have uh, a very important kind of proxy contest unfolding between the Quds Force and the Iranian government and its, um, you know, sort of adversaries in the in the Sunni world in Lebanon and elsewhere. Hezbollah is obviously the most important uh, and most capable instrument of that kind of proxy contest. It involves Israel. It involves um, sectarian and other ideological conflicts that the Iranian government's involved in. You know, I think. What's uh, interesting about Hezbollah and Hamas in the context of 9-11 and in all of this kind of loose talk that we've been having up here, I hope not too um, uh, loose about terrorism, is that you know, there is an important uh, narrative since 9-11 as well about the consequences of uh, terrorism by groups that are bounded by political territory versus the, the nature of terrorism that is carried out by groups that see themselves as having no assets to defend. So, so Hezbollah, for all of its viciousness and, and violence and radicalism, is, by comparison to Al-Qaeda, self-constraining because it requires uh, constituent politics and a place in Lebanese politics in order to build itself up. And you know, Hamas essentially governs a rump state in Gaza and, and Gaza and is uh, therefore self-limiting in the kinds of acts that it can carry out because it requires credibility in Europe and it requires credibility on the international stage in order to carry out its strategy. Now, that kind of guerrilla violence stroke terrorism has been a feature of, you know, subnational struggles. Maybe we apply new language for it. Maybe in a world of Al-Qaeda it has a different context, but it's been around for 200, 300 years. And that doesn't feel quite so new. If 9-11 had been the product of a Hezbollah conspiracy, then Hezbollah would have been destroyed and Lebanese politics would have been rearranged. Um, but Al-Qaeda was something less easy to attack because it didn't have that same kind of an address. Mm -hmm. right. More questions? Oh, hi. It's Dara McLeod. I'm with Refugees International. And we began by looking at Afghanistan and the fact that we're still there after 10 years. And obviously everyone now looking for an exit strategy. And one of the things we were there in May that we were looking at were the Afghan local police and the arming of militias, which is obviously a key part of Petraeus' exit strategy. But our w findings were that this ALP piece was actually one of the leading causes of destabilization, particularly in the North. And so I'd be curious to, a, get your impression of this idea of arming local militias and if it's successful in your view, and what arming local militias might mean for the country three, four years down the line when the West actually leaves. You know, one of the great successes in Afghanistan was the DDR program, the disarmament of uh, local militias in the 2005 time period. I think they 10,000 tons of heavy weapons and 60,000 men were disarmed. But it was a victim of its own success because it meant that when the Taliban came into a village, there was nobody, nobody was able to defend the village. So I think the Afghan local police, I've spent a fair amount of time in, in Afghanistan looking into it, um, has actually been quite successful. Obviously, there are going to be uh, problems with it anywhere. Um, but I think it's a, there were a number of safeguards. I mean, Karzai, you remember Petraeus and Karzai had a huge dust up when Petraeus went to Afghanistan for the first, and this, this was the main issue. And Karzai was really pushing back precisely because he was worried about new, new local militias. And I, one of Petraeus's first victory was to get him to agree to 10,000. Well, 
the 10,000 uh, are selected by the local uh, village. Uh, each, each local policeman is selected by a shura. The weapons are handed out by the Ministry of the Interior. To the extent that anything is organized in Afghanistan, uh, as you know, it's a somewhat chaotic country. Uh, this is a pretty well organized pr program. In terms of the Taliban, the Taliban are, we know from the, in the, the intelligence, they're very threatened by this because where are these ALPs going in? They're going into places that were basically Taliban free fire zones in Uruzgan and Sabal and Kandahar. And, um, so, you know, I, I think that it has been something of a success just in terms of dealing with the Taliban. Now, will it create further problems down the road? Well, you know, in Iraq, the Sons of Iraq pro uh, program, which is a sort of not totally un unanalogous program, hasn't been the sort of time bomb that a lot of people said it would be. Once they started, uh, you know, the, the, as my impression is the Sons of Iraq, some of them did join the army and the police, and some of them just, to, you know, they're, they're not sort of, they haven't become local militias themselves. So, you know, we'll, we'll see. Um, but I, I think there are some safeguards with the ALP program that are specifically designed to prevent the problems that you saw in the north. Do we take one or two more? Sure, we'll do a couple more. Uh, here and then here. Thank you. Uh, Richard Wetzel of the German Historical Institute. Um, you began in the, uh, at the start with the question, are there things that surprised us since 9-11? And one of the things that surprised me was with the ease with which the Bush administration could use the war and terror yeah. rhetoric to expand the national security state and essentially eviscerate civil liberties on all sorts of fronts, the warrantless surveillance, Guantanamo, detention without trial, the torture, and all these things. So I have two questions about this for you. One is, were you also as surprised as I was? And whether you were or not, you know, how do you explain the ease with which this was possible, really, the lack of resistance in American civil society to this, or any significant resistance? And my second question is, you mentioned that basically we haven't had any terrorist attacks in 10 years. And even so, it's been very difficult, apparently, for the Obama administration to roll back uh, s most of these things that Bush did on that front. And so the second question is, why after 10 years of no domestic terrorism or you know, foreign imported terrorism, um, is it still so difficult to uh, get some of these civil liberties back? That's well, it's for you, Susan. <laughs> 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 I mean, I, you know, uh, just on Guantanamo, it's Congress that is preventing the closure of Guantanamo. And that's, you know, our last, you know, they make the laws in this country. So uh, whether you agree with them or not, um, separate issue. It's not, uh, so, you know, I think. Well, and it was both Bush in his second term and Obama, by the way, who are both on the record as, as advocating for Guantanamo's closure. So it's, you know, obviously proved a, a confounding problem. And, you know, this, this, Congress continues to actually uh, grow the national security things. There's a very undercovered story happening right now uh, on the Hill in which they are proposing to uh, basically militarize and take out of the hands of the FBI any uh, arrest that can be connected even inside the United States to Al-Qaeda. And, and this, again, this is 10 years after the fact, when given all the things we talked about, I, which is why I do come back a little bit to the, the psychological dimension that we were talking about earlier uh, uh, of this nature. But, you know, there have been oscillations in American history uh, where we go back and forth. And certainly if you study uh, war times in Washington uh, and national security policy, this is not necessarily an outlier. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, in fact, very consistent with the pattern of, you know, look at uh, what laws were passed uh, in during World War I, uh, you know, look at what laws were passed during World War II. So, you know, the, the, the question is, what is the resilience of American institutions after the war? You know, where are we going to end up, I think, is as relevant of a question as what have we just done? Right. And I just at one thing, which is that analytically, you ask, if you ask it in an analytical tone, why? Well, of course, many of the victims of the worst abuses, the prisoners at Guantanamo, the people who were waterboarded, were not American citizens. And where American citizens were victimized by draconian security policies after 9-11, they tend to be objectified others, Muslims, who were not um, treated culturally with the same respect and sort of full rights of cultural integration that other minorities previously alienated had migrated into a state of sort of full cultural citizenship. So 
th those were, you know, failures of uh, the United States and its values, but it was sustainable for a while because the victims were, you know, others. And, um, you know, I also do think, without rationalizing any of those, any of that conduct, that the attackers on 9-11 and their allies pose a problem for national security that doesn't have easy categorical or other instrumental sort of precedent for it. They, they are warriors in the sense that they see themselves taking up arms as soldiers in a righteous cause, but they don't wear uniforms and they live in a battlefield that transcends national borders and w it doesn't involve formal declared conflicts. Now, you know, you can't wish away the complexity of those facts. They are a challenge. And you can argue in the face of the complexity of those facts that all of the constitutional and policing instruments and judicial instruments that were in place on 9-11 were fully adequate to meet that threat. That's a legitimate argument. But it's it wasn't persuasive <laughs> in the face of, uh, you know, the collapse of the two towers. And, and it's still an argument that I think quite a lot of reasonable people are wrestling with. They've narrowed the scope of their disagreement somewhat since 9-11, but the, but the puzzle remains. How do you construct a sustainable regime? And every democracy that is uh, targeted by such groups has, in fact, ended up struggling with this over a long period of time. Yeah, French magistrates can hold people for three years without. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they probably still can. So. Yeah. <laughs> okay, our last question. My name is Ken Dillon. Uh, I teach history at Marymount University. Uh, do you see it as a problem that uh, Americans still haven't come to a shared understanding about certain key uh, events uh, of uh, the year 2001? And that includes the anthrax mailings, which we've been told were uh, uh, done by Bruce Ivins. But many well-informed Americans disagree. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, it's 9-11, 10th anniversary, so I get a lot of questions. And it's not just Americans who don't have a shared understanding of what happened in 2001. And it's not just the anthrax attacks that puzzled them. I mean, I had a series of written questions just emailed to me this morning from an Egyptian journalist at a leading e Egyptian newspaper. And the first question was, do most Americans still believe that Osama bin Laden was responsible for 9-11? In the face of so much kind of yeah, yeah, Exactly. That, that sort of, that had such a kind of, are you still beating your wife tone to it. I, mean, I could just write back and say, yes, because he was. But then I would sound like an arrogant, you know. So I, I think. Um, there's something not just about these kinds of events, and, the, and you think about um, terrorism, assassination, conspiracy in the history of not just the United States, but you know, certainly all Western societies. And there's a constant literature of revision and uncertainty and reinterpretation because of the nature of the event. It's, it is uh, hidden and therefore subject to argument and, and misinterpretation, and it's a problem exacerbated in our culture by the diversity of publishing that's now available. Everyone can um, essentially publish their own narrative of these things and argue in that space. So we're, you know, that's, that's the democracy we live in. We'll just have to make the best of it. Yeah, 40, I think 46% of Egyptians think uh, that the Jews were behind uh, the 9-11 attack. But 70% of Americans thought Saddam was personally involved six months into the Iraq war and continued, the number stayed at like 30% for five years later. So right. conspiracy theories are not, you know. Uh, Although we, I would say this, the persistence in the United States of conspiracy theories about, about September the 11th yeah. is very low yeah. uh, overall. I mean, Persistence is very low. Well, yeah, there, was that, there was that phase towers. when people thought that the Pentagon attack was fake. Right. Right. <laughs> right. I mean, quite a lot of Americans looked at the video and concluded that it had been photoshopped or something. But uh, in a lot of ways, right, our, our, our dissonance is also with other parts of the world, and that's part of the problem, I think, right. of for American power yeah. projecting forwards. But thank you so much to all of you coming out and braving this rainstorm. Yep. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's lots to read out there in uh, terms of September 11th uh, commemoration. So thank you again. Thank you.